Uh, welcome everybody to our summer CLE series. Uh, this is presentation number four. And tonight we're gonna be talking about some of the voting issues that uh, college voters face uh, across the nation. So uh, I'm Carl Blair and I am an election protection attorney at TCRP. And before we begin, I'd just like to take a quick moment to tell you a little bit about our organization. Uh, like I said, we are the Texas Civil Rights Project, and we are Texas Lawyers for Texas Communities. Uh, we were founded in 1990. We are a nonpartisan 501c3. Uh, in our organization, we have three units, a Beyond Borders unit, which deals with border and immigration issues. We have our Criminal and Justice unit, which deals with criminal justice reforms. And we have our voting rights team, which uh, both Emily and I are a part of. Uh, and our organization has done some form of election protection work every election cycle since 2016. Excuse me. Um, so here's an outline of today's presentation that's going to give us a roadmap of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, section one, we're going to go through a little bit of a historical background. We're going to start with a look at a brief timeline of who could vote in America. And then we're going to move into a discussion about the fight for the 26th Amendment. Uh, and then we're going to move on to section two, which details voting issues college students can face. Uh, and some of those issues are residency requirements, voter ID requirements, uh, limited access to polling locations on campus, and also something that's Texas specific, which is uh, limited ballots. And then we're going to wrap up our discussion tonight with section three, which is a, is a case study of Prairie View A&M and the 50 year legacy of voter suppression against students who attend uh, Prairie View A&M. Uh, then we're going to move on to what you can do to help protect voting rights for, uh, for our fellow Texans. And then whatever time we have left, we're going to move into a, a question and answer session. So if you have any questions while we're going through the presentation tonight, just put any questions in the chat window and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's dive in. So section one, like I said, this is a historical background. Um, and this slide right here owes its existence to my colleague at TCRP, Emily. Uh, you probably heard she and I were talking just a minute ago. Uh, she gave a fantastic CLE presentation a few weeks ago on the history of voting rights in America. And in case anybody's wondering, we're gonna be making all five of our summer CLE series presentations. Uh, we're recording all of them. We're gonna make them available to the public uh, after the series is done next week. Uh, look out for those recordings. Uh, feel free to pass them along to anybody who may be interested, anybody, any organizations, any colleagues, friends, neighbors, family. Um, the more people who see them, the better. Um, and so if you get the chance to go back and see the previous three and also next week's, I highly recommend that. Okay, so in 1788, the Constitution was ratified. And at that time, the only people who were allowed to vote in the United States were white male landowners. Now, one thing that's interesting is that that landowning requirement gradually faded away for white males. And by 1828, it no longer applied to presidential elections. And by 1856, it had all but disappeared at all levels of government. Uh, in 1870, uh, black men won the right to vote with the passage of the 15th Amendment. Um, unfortunately, in 1877, Reconstruction ends, and that very quickly leads into the Jim Crow era of the early 1880s to 1965. Uh, there's no consensus exactly when the Jim Crow era began, but the general consensus is that it started in the early 1880s. Um, and another fact to point out there is immediately after Reconstruction ends, uh, the, the federal soldiers are withdrawn. Uh, most, almost every one of the former Confederate states rewrote their constitutions, <coughs> excuse me, rewrote their constitutions to re-enshrine the disenfranchisement of non-white men. Uh, in 1920, women won the right to vote with the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment, although due to the Jim Crow laws that were in effect in large portions of the country, uh, many, of those, uh, many of those states restricted that to only white women. Uh, between 1924 and 1962, through a series of uh, legislative uh, actions and court cases, indigenous people across the country earned their right to vote as well. Uh, in 1943, Chinese American immigrants won the right to vote after Congress repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act. And then in 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed, 
which coupled with the Civil Rights Act of the previous year, uh, marked at least officially the end of the Jim Crow era. And then we have to jump all the way to 1971 for 18 to 20 year olds to win the right to vote with the passage and ratification of the 26th, <clears throat> excuse me, with the 26th Amendment. All right, so what led up to the passage and ratification of the 26th Amendment? In November 11th, uh, November 11th, 1942, Congress approved lowering the draft age from 21 years old to 18 years old. And it's important to note that at that specific time in history, every single state in the union had a minimum voting age of 21. Uh, you, you may have heard the phrase old enough to fight, old enough to vote. It actually first became a rallying cry for those seeking to lower the voting age to 18 around this time during World War II. In 1942, uh, Representative Jennings Randolph from West Virginia introduced the first federal legislation to lower the voting age to 18. And over the next 40 years that he was in office, Representative and then later Senator Randolph would introduce that same legislation another 11 times. And that actually earned him the nickname, the father of the 26th Amendment. Uh, moving forward a year, in 1943, Georgia became the first state to lower the voting age from 21 to 18 for state and local elections. So we skip ahead a few years, and in 1954, during his State of the Union address that year, President Eisenhower becomes the first sitting president to publicly call for a constitutional amendment, lowering the voting age to 18 years old for all elections. And then throughout the 60s, as America's involvement in the Vietnam War deepened, calls to lower the voting age intensified yet again. Uh, and by the end of the decade in 1969, Congress had introduced at least 60 separate resolutions to lower the voting age. All right, and this slide's a little detailed, so we're gonna, we're gonna spend a minute on this one. In June, 1970, Congress amends the voting, right, uh, the voting Rights Act of 1965 by including provisions that, lowered the that would lower the voting age to 18 in federal, state, and local elections. It would ban the use of literacy tests in federal, state, and local elections. It would eliminate durational residency requirements of greater than 30 days for presidential elections. It would prohibit states from cutting off voter registration more than 30 days prior to presidential elections. And it would establish uniform national rules for absentee voting in presidential elections. Um, and the fact that some of those uh, provisions only applied to presidential elections while others applied to federal, state, and local elections, uh, as we can see on the next couple of slides, that was a really important, uh, that was a really important distinction. All right, so we jump ahead just a few months to October of 1970, when the Supreme Court heard a challenge to those brand new uh, amendments to the Voting Rights Act in the case of Oregon v. Mitchell. And the court handed down their decision in 1970. Oh, I'm sorry, December 1970. Uh, so it, I've, I read through the decision and to call it extremely fractured is, is not an understatement at all. On certain rules, you had a 5-4 majority in, uh, on one issue and other issues, you had a separate five to four majority. And in almost none of the issues whatsoever, did you have a majority opinion agreeing on the reasons for their, for their conclusions? So it was a very, very fractured decision that was handed down in December of 1970. So for our purposes, um, I wanted to focus on three main holdings from the case. One, the Supreme Court held that Congress had the authority to lower the voting age to 18 for federal elections, but not for state and local elections. Two, Congress had the authority to ban the use of literacy tests and other similar tests in federal, state, and local elections. And then three, Congress had the authority to prohibit residency requirements of more than 30 days and set nationwide absentee ballot rules for presidential elections only. So this led to a situation where you had um, 18 to 20 year olds across the country who would be eligible to register and vote for say president or vice president. But depending on the state that they lived in and were voting in, they may not be able to vote for state and local offices like governor or mayor. So by way of explanation, Justice Black who ended up delivering the court's opinion, he wrote in his majority opinion, our judgments today give the federal government the power the framers conferred upon it. 
That is the final control of the elections of its own officers. Our judgments also say for the states the power to control state and local elections, which the Constitution originally reserved to them, and which no subsequent amendment has taken from. And as the next slide shows, Congress took him up on that last point very quickly. So remember, June 1970, Congress amends the Voting Rights Act. December 1970, the Supreme Court hands down their decision in Oregon v. Mitchell. And then on March 10th and March 23rd, 1971, the Senate and the House respectively voted overwhelmingly in favor of the proposed 26th Amendment and sent it to the states for ratification. Uh, and in case you're wondering, the Senate passed the proposed amendment unanimously and the House passed it by a vote of 401 to 19. So a mere 97 days after it's sent to the states for ratification, on July 1st, 1971, North Carolina becomes the 38th state to vote to ratify the proposed amendment and the 26th amendment comes into effect. And this is by far the fastest ratification of an amendment in US history. So after all of that, so after 30 years of legislative uh, efforts of court cases, we get to the point where the, the 26th amendment comes into force, it's ratified and it becomes the law of the land. So what does the 26th amendment actually say? This is the entire amendment right here. It's, it's, it's very short. Section one says the right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of age. And then section two, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now, at the time it was ratified in 1971, uh, it was estimated that the 26th amendment uh, that the 26th Amendment's passage would mean an increase of about 10 million potential voters nationwide. And by 2022, the number of 18 to 21, uh, I'm sorry, the number of 18 to 20 year olds in the US had risen to about 12.9 million. So the passage and ratification of the 26th Amendment immediately impacted millions of young Americans in 1971. And it continues to provide the basis for millions of young Americans today to exercise their right to vote. All right, so that's, that was our discussion, our historical background. So just kind of keep that fight and that struggle for the 26th Amendment in mind um, as we move on to section two, where we're gonna talk about some of the challenges facing college voters uh, 51 years after the 26th Amendment's passed. Now, I wanna point out that these issues impact college voters across, college students nationwide to varying degrees. But as we'll see as we move through both this section and then section three of this presentation, uh, specifically talking about Prairie View a and uh, you're going to see that Texas election law makes some of these challenges even more pronounced for college students in our state as opposed to other states. All right, so here's another little roadmap. Um, so these are the issues we're going to discuss. The, the very first issue is, it's, as we'll see, it's a very contentious issue, and it's also a very uh, complicated issue. So we're going to start with residency requirements. And uh, address issues can play a part in that residency requirement as well. Uh, then we're going to move on to voter ID issues. We're going to also discuss limited access to on-campus polling locations. And then this last one, some of you may be familiar with, you may have heard of it before. It's not a challenge or an issue that college students face. It's a potential way for certain eligible college students to uh, cast at least uh, to cast a limited ballot, as it's called in Texas. That, that may enable them to take part in a, an election that they otherwise would just not vote in. So we'll get to that one last. All right, so before we talk about any of the residency requirements or voter ID issues, polling location issues, I wanted to just take a second to remind everybody who is a qualified voter in Texas or who's eligible to vote. So the Texas election code defines a qualified voter as a person who is 18 years of age or older. They are a US citizen. They haven't been determined by a court to be mentally incapacitated. They're a resident of the state. And notice that that one's bolded and italicized. They're also a registered voter and they have not been finally convicted of a felony or they have fully discharged their sentence if they have been convicted of a felony. Um, and if you're interested in that last point, uh, two weeks ago, I 
I presented a CLE presentation on uh, incarcerated voters. It was one of our summer CLE series. So feel free to look that up uh, when we make those available to the public. So I, I think that most of the people on this call are probably familiar with at least the majority of those opinions. You know, 18 years of age, US citizen, resident of Texas, registered voter. Um, but for our purposes here tonight, talking about college voters, we're gonna focus on that residency requirement. Okay, so what does residency mean in Texas? What does it mean to be a resident of Texas? So each state has the authority to determine what constitutes residency uh, in their state and in, their, in the various counties of their state as well. So I wanted to take a, a minute to kind of go through the Texas Election Code section, which talks about and defines residents uh, for voting rights purposes in Texas. So that's Texas Election Code section 1.015. So we're gonna go through this subsection by subsection. So A, in this code, residence means domicile. That is one's home and fixed place of habitation to which one intends to return after any temporary absence. Uh, B, a person may not establish residence for the purpose of influencing the outcome of a certain election. C, a person does not lose the person's residence by leaving the person's home to go to another place for temporary purposes only. D, a person does not acquire a residence in a place to which the person has come for temporary purposes only and without the intention of making that place the person's home. And then F, I want you to think about F in the context of a college student who moves out of his, his parents' house um, and is trying to decide whether they wanna to register to vote where they go to school or if they would wanna to register to vote where you know, they're their permanent residence at their parents' house. So section F says a person may not designate a previous residence as a home and fixed place of habitation unless the person inhabits the place at the time of designation and intends to remain. Um, now, reading all of those, that's about as clear as mud, to be honest. Um, and in case you're wondering, I know many of us are lawyers on this, on, on this call, the terms temporary, establish, and influence, they're not defined anywhere in the election code. <laughs> they're not defined anywhere in this section of the election code or other sections either. Um, and as if all of this wasn't confusing enough, between the lack of definitions and just the way that the, the, the way that the subsections are worded, just yesterday, U.S. District Judge Lee Yakel of the Western District of Texas permanently enjoined Texas from enforcing subsections B and F, the two bolded and italicized sections, saying that neither subsection can, quote, overcome any degree of constitutional scrutiny. Uh, as to subsection B, Judge Yako wrote in part that election code section 1.015 defines residence without defining establish or influencing. The rule therefore bars prospective voters from establishing a home and fixed place of habitation for obviously permitted purposes such as voting. And as for subsection F, the one at the very bottom, Judge Yako wrote, this creates a man without a country. A college student cannot acquire a residence in the college town where they will study only temporarily, nor can the student designate as a residence the hometown they have stopped inhabiting, albeit temporarily. And Judge Aiko continues by saying, the court is unable to discern where college students should register as the provision is written. And the possible repercussions are not just complete disenfranchisement, but also criminal liability. So I wanted to take a second to acknowledge that in virtually any legal context, the establishment of residence or residency is, tends to be very vague. Um, it tends to be fact intensive and decided on a case by case basis. That's particularly problematic in the case of voting rights, because as we'll see, as we move through to the section on Prairie View A&M, the lack of a bright line rule of how to establish residency um, can obviously lead to confusion on the part of voters, but it can also lead to voter suppression um, when those ambiguities and that lack of clarity um, are, are used by officials acting in bad faith. Um, having said all that, it's still our understanding and our, our belief that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
it's still our belief that um, the intent of the voter in question remains the predominant and most important factor for establishing residency. So yeah, that, that's, that's a tricky concept to, to get around, but we're going to see several examples when we talk about Prairie View A&M, how uh, county officials use some of those ambiguities and that lack of clarity to suppress uh, student votes. So in 1972, the Supreme Court heard the case of Dunn v. Blumstein, and they struck down a Tennessee law that required someone to reside in the state of Tennessee for at least one year, and the specific county they wanted to vote in for at least three months before being eligible to register and vote in congressional, state, and local elections. Um, and in his majority opinion, Justice Marshall stated that, that states did have a compelling interest in ensuring that people who were voting in their elections were bona fide residents. But these lengthy durational residency, and we've heard that phrase before a few slides back, but these lengthy durational residency laws, like the Tennessee law in question, quote, exclude too many people who should not and need not be excluded. And so the court ended up holding that such laws violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment as they are not necessary to further a compelling state interest. All right, and this is, uh, and then, we're, so we're gonna move from 1972 up to 1979, when the Supreme Court heard the case of Sim v. US. Um, and this case ties in directly to section three of our discussion. So I wanted to give some background on this case. Uh, so Sim was a case arising from the conduct of the Waller County, Texas, tax assessor collector, Leroy Sim. Um, as, uh, as we'll discuss later, Waller County is home to Prairie View A&M, which is the first and largest HBCU in the state of Texas. And as tax assessor collector, uh, Sim was in charge of Waller County's voter registration and its voter rolls. So the background, what happened then in the, the 70s was, I remember the, the 26th Amendment was passed and ratified in, in 1971. So this type of behavior took place almost instantly after the 26th Amendment was ratified. But Sim and his deputies, they set up a system where anyone that they knew personally to be county residents and anyone who appeared on the county tax rolls as owning property in Waller County were registered to vote without any additional scrutiny. They were basically just given the green light as soon as they filled out the required paperwork. Um, anyone, who, anyone who sought to register to vote who didn't fall into one of those two categories was required to complete an additional residency questionnaire, which asked in relevant part to our discussion tonight, whether the applicant was a college student. And if the applicant was indeed a college student, they were then asked further questions about things like their home address, uh, whether their family owned any property in Waller County, uh, their current employment status, and their future plans, like whether they intended to stay in Waller County or whether they were going to move away after they graduated. Uh, the U.S. Attorney General brought suit against Sim, Waller County, the state of Texas, the Texas Secretary of State, and the Texas Tur Attorney General, alleging that the questionnaire violated the 14th Amendment, the 26th Amendment, portions of the Voting Rights Act, and provisions of other federal laws. Um, and they actually sought a permanent injunction against SIM from using the questionnaire. Um, there's a special provision in the Voting Rights Act that allows for a three district court, uh, I'm sorry, a three judge district court panel to hear these types of cases. And that's, that's the route that this, case went, that this case went through. So the district court panel that heard the case granted the permanent injunction against SIM and extremely importantly, held that college students had the right to register and vote where they go to school. And so when the Supreme Court heard the case, they summarily affirmed the district court's ruling, uh, both upholding the injunction and the ruling that students have the right to register and vote in the community where they attend school. Um, if they hadn't, this would be basically the end of this presentation. So. Uh, it's it's really a, a very important case, um, you know, arising. I, I'm in Houston, so it's kind of arising in my own backyard. You know, Waller County is not far from here. And as we'll see in our section on Prairie View A&M, 
um, the students 40 plus years after sim are still having to fight these same type of battles. So I, I kind of see this as a subset issue of the residency requirements. Uh, but these are like, these are more practical address issues college students can face. Um, on certain campuses, uh, certain on-campus housing facilities may not have a specific street address. Uh, residential addresses may differ from the mailing addresses students use on campus. And students may not be aware that they have the right to register and vote at either their on-campus residential address or their permanent address. Um, now, as amended last year, Section 15.054D of the Texas Election Code does allow for students to use an on-campus PO box or dorm address as their voter registration address. But that provision only applies to full-time students who live on campus. And as Judge Yackel wrote in the decision we discussed a few slides ago, this new provision doesn't help establish residency. It merely helps establish rules to verify where a student's residence is located. So now on to a slightly more straightforward uh, issue that some college students can face, and that's issues regarding voter ID requirements. So many out-of-state students attending schools in states with voter ID requirements, uh, they may lack an acceptable form of identification, uh, such as a driver's license or a state ID card to vote where they attend school. Um, now, as I'm sure we're all aware, Texas has one of the strictest voter ID laws in the nation, but student IDs, even if they're from a public college or university, and even when they include the student's name and their photo, are not one of the accepted forms of voter ID. And since they don't usually include the student's address, they aren't generally one of the accepted forms of supporting IDs for voters who need to fill out a reasonable impediment declaration either. Um, now, it's important to note that in Texas, the address on the ID a voter presents to vote and the address where they registered to vote do not have to match. Um, now, and photo IDs and supporting IDs for reasonable impediment declarations are required in order to verify the identity of the voter, not their address. Uh, now, I want to I want to preface this slide on limited access to on-campus polling locations. I want to preface this slide by pointing out that a plethora of studies and ongoing research from political scientists and civic organizations across the country uh, indicate that the farther people have to travel to vote, the less likely they are to vote. You know, it's, it's a pretty common sense, it's pretty common sense understanding, or pretty common sense finding, I should say. But yeah, generally, all of these studies are indicating that for every extra mile that somebody has to drive to vote, there's, I, I've seen the number around 0.5% less likelihood of them voting. So in any one person that happens to, that number isn't, isn't, you know, 0.5 per mile isn't a huge number, but when it starts to add up and you have large areas with large populations where they don't have accessible polling locations, those numbers start to add up really quickly. And so with that in mind, between 2013 and 2018, Texas closed approximately 750 polling locations across the state. And in 2019 and 2022, House Bills 1888 and, and 3107 respectively made the use of temporary polling locations during early voting, which were frequently used on college campuses and nursing homes, more difficult for counties to, uh, to implement. Now, currently, in counties with more than 100,000 residents, every temporary polling place must be open the exact same days as the main polling place, and for at least eight hours on each and every one of those days. And that can be a big burden to, uh, to county budgets, to county personnel, because um, that requires extra staffing, um, obviously, that requires uh, having the facility, housing the facility, all of that. So you're going to have some counties that may be more inclined to not place any temporary polling locations at college campuses or nursing homes than try and deal with the staffing uh, and money issues. Um, and yet, even despite all of those drastic cuts in the number of polling locations across the state in recent years, there still remains no requirement that Texas colleges or universities provide students with an on-campus polling location, either during early voting or on election day. All right, so now we're gonna move, those were some of the challenges that we're, we've discussed the last uh, couple of issues. 
Uh, but now I wanted to bring something to everybody's attention. It's not a particularly well-known uh, provision of the election code, but it's, a, it's an option that may help some eligible college students uh, be able to cast a ballot when they otherwise might not realize that they uh, had that option. And that's limited ballots. And these are a Texas specific, uh, Texas specific issue here. So Texas election code, uh, section 112.002. This details who can cast a limited ballot. So a voter registered in one Texas county who moves to a new Texas county and whose voter registration in their new county won't be effective on or before the voter registration deadline 30 days prior to election day is eligible to vote a limited ballot. So to vote a limited ballot, you have to be registered in one Texas county, registered to vote in a Texas county. You have to move to another county in Texas and you you have to try and you have to start your registration process in Texas, but your registration in your new county can't be effective in uh, more than 30 days prior to election day. So if you meet those qualifications, you would be eligible to vote a limited ballot. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we're going to go into a discussion of when and where can a voter cast a limited ballot. So voters may cast a limited ballot only during the early voting period. Uh, if they want to cast a ballot in person, they have to vote. They, they have to cast their ballot in person only at the main early voting polling place in their new county of residence. Um, and that is usually going to be located at the county's election office, but they're going to have that listed. They're going to have the exact address listed uh, on each county's website. Um, you can also cast a limited ballot by mail, but only if the voter is otherwise eligible to vote by mail, and they have to submit their application for a ballot by mail to the early voting clerk in their new county. So now we've gotten to who's eligible to cast a limited ballot, when can they cast a limited ballot, where can they cast a limited ballot. But what's on a limited ballot? So a person who is entitled to, to cast a limited ballot, they can vote on all statewide races and any district offices that are in common between their former county of residence and their new county of residence. Um, so obviously that means statewide races like governor, lieutenant governor, uh, railroad commissioner, all of, all of those statewide races. And then any district offices that are in common between where they used to live and where they live now. Um, so for instance, Texas has 31 state Senate districts. Um, obviously many of those districts are going to cross county lines. So if you move from one county to another county, uh, within the state, the same state Senate district, you could vote on that race. Um, but if you move from one county to another county, you're out, you change, uh, state representative districts. That's not about, that's not a race that you could vote for because it's not in common between, your old place of residence and your new county of residence. So why do I bring this up in, in the discussion of college voters? Um, I, I brought it up, I have some personal experience with this. A couple of years ago, I worked in a similar position to what I have now at a different organization. And this was during the 2020 election cycle. And we got reports that from a college town that a lot of students were casting provisional ballots like a disproportionate number, a number that was much higher than normal or we would expect to be cast uh, as provisional ballots. So we reached out to the county elections administrator and we found out that some college professors on the local college campus were offering uh, extra credit for their students to go vote. And so you had a lot of students who just vote, cast their ballot. They didn't really, they didn't really care that it would, wouldn't count as a provisional ballot. Um, and then we contacted the president of the university and just explained the situation to him, uh, kind of walked him through what a limited ballot was and that we were concerned that some of the students who had cast provisional ballots may have been eligible to cast limited ballots. Um, and within 24 hours, he had notified uh, via email, the entire student body, we, sorry, we wrote him a small document, like a one page document that just detailed the process that, that we've just gone over tonight 
Um, and then within 24 hours after that, he had sent that document out to the entire student body. Um, now, I have no way of knowing how many students uh, may have taken up the offer to cast a limited ballot or not, but I do know that they were at least given that information. So I, I, see, two, I see two benefits from that. One is that there are university officials, college officials who are willing to help. Uh, same with elections administrators. Not all of them. Not all of them may be so willing to work with us on that, but some of them definitely are. Um, and two, the more students who are appraised or made aware of this opportunity, uh, it provides those eligible students with another option to cast a ballot. Um, because for all intents and purposes, when they cast those provisional ballots, it was, you know, they weren't even really trying to cast their ballot in a way that it would be counted. Um, the problem being, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this section on limited ballots, is it's not well known. And as we can all see and probably all agree, it's a little bit confusing to get through. So if we can inform more college students uh, and more administrators at their universities and colleges of the option of a limited ballot, um, we feel that that would help uh, that would help some of those eligible students who might otherwise not cast a ballot or not even try to vote. All right, and so now we move on to section three. And we're gonna look at a detailed uh, case study of Prairie View A&M and the 50 year plus legacy of voter suppression uh, towards students at Prairie View A&M. All right, to set the scene, uh, the city of Prairie View, where Prairie View A&M is located, is approximately 82% black. Prairie View A&M itself has about 9,300 uh, 9, students, 85% uh, of whom are black. But Waller County as a whole has a black population of only 21%. So this legacy of voter suppression is very much rooted in the racism of the Jim Crow era. Um, now in 1876, Prairie View A&M was founded as the first state-supported college in Texas for black students. And as I mentioned earlier, it remains the largest HBCU in Texas to this day. Um, in mid-1970s, our friend Leroy Sim makes a reappearance in this slide when, as we mentioned before, he required Prairie View A&M students to fill out a very invasive questionnaire before registering to vote. And as we mentioned it before again, uh, the Supreme Court upheld Prairie View A&M students' right to vote where they go to school in Sim versus U.S. We're going to skip ahead a few years to 1992, when multiple Prairie View A&M students were charged with improper voting. Um, and as an aside here, uh, part of the issue was that Prairie View A&M's campus was found to be so gerrymandered that students who simply moved from one dorm to another could find themselves in an entirely different voting precinct. Um, and then due to uh, intervention by both activist organizations and the Department of Justice, all 19 of those uh, students charged with improper voting, all of their cases were subsequently dismissed. Uh, in 2004, the NAACP launched a lawsuit against the Waller County DA for threatening criminal charges against Prairie View A&M students for voting in local elections and against Waller County for providing only one day of early voting on campus. Um, the DOJ also intervened uh, in this. Uh, and what was happening was the Waller County DA was threatening Prairie View A&M students um, after he claimed that students didn't have the same automatic presumption of residency that other Waller County residents were being afforded. So once again, it took uh, direct intervention and action by activists, organizations like the NAACP and the DOJ before, um, before all of those types of threats and uh, any threatened charges were, were dropped by the Waller County DA. It wasn't until 2013 when Prairie View A&M finally got its first on-campus election day polling location. And then in 2016, uh, Waller County reached an agreement with the university to allow students to register one of two on-campus addresses, but one of those addresses was in a different voting precinct from the rest of the campus, which again caused widespread confusion. 
uh, in 2018, uh, Waller County Elections Administrator tells Prairie View A&M that many students will have to re-register due to being told to register using an address in a different precinct. Um, now, this time it was actually the Texas Secretary of State's office which stepped in, and then the students didn't end up having to re-register. But also in 2018, Waller County failed to provide uh, both Prairie View A&M and the City of Prairie View with a single location for the entire first week of early voting. Uh, they only relented and provided such a location after a lawsuit was filed in federal court. And from 2020 until the present, we still have Prairie View A&M students fighting to get the same number of early voting opportunities as other residents of Waller County. So we're going to wrap this section up with a couple of quotes about the continued fight for voting rights by the students of Prairie View A&M. Uh, professor Peniel Joseph, a UT Austin professor of history and government affairs, has said that Waller County has become, over the past 48 years, perhaps the most difficult place for a Black student to vote in Texas. And Jayla Allen, who's a third generation Prairie View A&M grad, and she was the lead plaintiff in the 2018 lawsuit that we just mentioned, she's quoted as saying, it's not that we wanted a polling location set in our lap. We just wanted fair and equal access to one with the appropriate days and hours. So I'd like to point out that as long as this list of voter suppression directed towards the students of Prairie View A&M in the slideshow is, it's not an exhaustive list by far. And it's been 51 years since the 26th Amendment was ratified and Prairie View A&M students are still fighting for equal voting opportunities. So what are some of the next steps that those of us on this call, or those of us who care about this issue, what are some of the next steps that we can take to try and protect and promote voting rights for young Americans and college students? Well, one, we can advocate for legislation and policies at the federal, state, and local levels that ensure the voting rights of young Americans are protected and promoted. In Texas specifically, you can county commissioners to open up polling locations on local college campuses and to provide students with better access to information on both voter registration and how to cast their ballots. And finally, you can support organizations fighting to ensure that young Americans are given accurate information about their voting rights, and just as importantly, the assistance they need to exercise those rights. So on the federal level, on July 11th of this year, just a mere few weeks ago, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Representative Nakima Williams introduced the Youth Voting Rights Act which would directly address many of the issues we've spoken about here today. Among other things, the Youth Voting Rights Act would provide a private right of action to enforce the 26th Amendment. It would expand voter registration services at public colleges and universities. It would require institutions of higher education to have on-campus polling places. It would codify a prohibition on durational residency requirements and absentee ballot limitations for all federal elections. It would also codify the right to vote from a college domicile, and it would require that states accept student IDs to meet voter ID requirements. Um, and I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that if this bill were to become law, it would be another landmark piece of legislation to protecting voting rights, and particularly voting rights for young Americans. Uh, on the state level, Representative Gina Hinojosa sponsored HB 93, during the last legislative session back in 2021. And this bill would have required county commissioners to designate a location on the main campus of any public university in their county if the university has more than 8,000 enrolled students. Uh, we're talking about UT system uh, universities, A&M system universities, University of Houston, uh, Sam Houston State, Stephen F. Austin. Um, it's, a, it's a large number of universities that would be covered by this, including Prairie View a &M. Uh, And the bill also would have required that such a polling location be open for the same hours as the main early voting polling location in their county and on election day. Uh, this would have been a big win for voting accessibility for uh, college students in Texas, but unfortunately the bill never even made it out of the House Elections Committee. So legislation like the Youth Voting Rights Act or House Bill 93 um, would certainly increase the opportunities for college students across the country to exercise their right to vote. So after all of that, I, I wanna leave us all with a quote from Karen Flynn, the president of Common Cause about the lasting importance of the 26th Amendment 
and why it's as important as ever to continue to fight, to expand, protect, and promote voting rights for young Americans. Quote, democracy is how we work together to solve the pressing issues of our times. When democracy works best, it also secures the future, and that future belongs to young people. There's more work to do so that the 26th Amendment lives up to its promise of a more empowered, reflective, and representative democracy. Now, after all of that, if you find yourself asking, uh, if you find yourself asking yourself, how can I help? What can I do? Then I and Emily and all my colleagues at TCRP, we want you to join our nonpartisan election protection coalition this election season as an election protection volunteer. Uh, you can find out more information and sign up to join the fight to protect voting rights for all Texans at the link listed on this slide. It's txcivilrights.org slash 22 EP legal. Now, what would you be doing as a legal volunteer? Uh, the easiest way we've come up with describing it is you'd be providing customer service for Texas voters trying to navigate our state's draconian and, and Byzantine laws. You'd get to solve complex issues to help voters and ex to help voters exercise their right. And we're operating command centers all across Texas during early voting and on election day to address the systemic issues that arise and for those of you who are litigation minded, we do file litigation if necessary too. So now we get to the final slide and I, you'll hear me stop talking in just a moment and I'll turn everything over to y'all for questions. Um, I know why you're all here. You want, the, you want that CLE credit. So here is the course number and you can also scan that QR code that's on the screen. The course number is 17416418. That's 17416418. And again, I urge you to sign up and become an, a legal volunteer for, with our Election Protection Coalition by going to txcivilrights.org slash 22 EP legal. Uh, that's it. I'm sure you're all tired of hearing my voice now. So I will turn over the remainder of our time to a question and answer session. Um, and yeah, so just please uh, make all your questions and comments. Remember that to be respectful to our other participants and put those in the chat window. So, all right, yes, uh, Emily said we'll be sending all the CLEs around to all attendees of the series after we wrap up next week. Carl, we've got a couple questions in the Q and A tab. Uh, Barbara Larkin asked, uh, do you recommend that students vote at home or at college or no preference? Um, we don't really have it. That's, that's entirely up to the individual voter or the individual college student. Um, some might find it easier to register at their, uh, use their permanent address as their registration uh, address uh, while others want to register on campus. Um, one's not necessarily better than the other, it's it's dealer's choice, if you will. It's entirely up to their um, to their choice. Um, Archna, I and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but I don't know exactly how long limited ballots have been around. Um, I know that they've been around for several election cycles at least. Um, but yeah, it's it's not something that's very well known or publicized. Um, I'm not going out on a limb and saying that the state of Texas, as currently constituted, um, they don't spend much at all. They don't put much priority on public education for voting rights. Um, I've done some research for another project and the Texas Secretary of State has hundreds of millions, uh, like $125 million budget for their two-year annual or for their two-year biennial cycle. And only about three and a half million of that's directed towards public education for, uh, for voters. Um, so it's a, it's a minuscule fraction. And I think I did back of the napkin math and that rounds out to about 17 cents per Texan. So, um, yeah, so, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how long limited ballots have been around, but I do know, like I said, that they've been around for a couple of election cycles, but it's something that most Texans are aware of. Uh, Carl, I did not know either when limited ballots came to be in Texas. And so I just Googled and it looks from the statute like they were introduced in 1985. There you go. 1985. So, uh, well, I'm, I was born in 1983. So about 37 years. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you think about it that way, it's 37 years that they've been active in some form or fashion. And yet 
the vast majority of Texans have no idea that that's even an option. Um, yeah. So I think that one of the things in, is there a link to some students? Um, Emily, do you, do you have a, can, are we going to include a link? Okay. Yeah, I've got something up. I'll drop it in the chat in just a second. Right, thanks. Um, yeah. So I think that that goes back to what, what I was just talking about, the lack of real effort on the part of the state government to uh, provide public education on voting rights. Um, it's not just limited ballots that, that are, are, you know, that's not the only provision of the election code or voting rights in Texas that the general public doesn't know much about. Um, yeah, I, I have my suspicions of why that may be, but you know, that's for another time that's not being recorded. Um, but that's why I think that part of what is so important about bills uh, like the Youth Voting Rights Act, another portion of the Youth Voting Rights Act, I didn't include it on that slide, but another portion of that Voting Rights Act specifically sets up a program uh, to provide states with uh, monetary incentives and the money itself to increase um, uh, voter education outreach to college students. Um, and I'm, I am never going to say that it's a bad thing for voter education and public outreach to be increased. Um, and to have it done at a federal level and trickle down through the states, um, you know, you're gonna have different states that are gonna approach that differently. Some states are gonna be aggressive about that voter education outreach and some states like Texas aren't, are not going to be. So even if legislation like the Youth Voting Rights Act pass, as big a deal as that would be, it would still take activists like yourselves on the call, organizations like TCRP and our, our coalition partners, it would still take um, our active participation in making sure that that education and that outreach to college students, to other vulnerable communities, that that was done. So it's not as big as it would be, it's not the end of the fight. So we have about three more minutes. So if there are any other questions, drop them in the chat right now. And if not, I'll, I'll give it a minute. And uh, all right, well, okay, that's a no open questions. So um, I will let everybody go. I will leave the screen with the course number and QR code up. So if anybody still needs to write that down, they'll have another minute to do that. Um, but I thank you very, very much for attending. Um, like I said, uh, please, if you get a chance, once we have them posted, go back and look at the previous three presentations. And Emily, what's your presentation on next week? Next week, I will be asking a bunch of different voting rights advocates from different organizations their least favorite voting rights myth and how they, uh, what they say when folks uh, have that misconception, voting rights myths and how to bust them. There you go. And that'll be held at the same time on Wednesday, August 10th at 6 p.m. Central. And Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, but people can use the same Zoom link they did to access this one, correct? That's correct. Awesome. Well, we hope to see you all there. And thank you so much for joining us. And uh, don't forget to sign up at txcivilrights.org slash 22EP legal. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.